We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to pick the law. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every member is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and I just literally got up. I laid down for, geez, a minute. Um, I only meant to lay down for like five minutes, and I wake up and I'm like, fuck, the show's on. So I apologize for being five minutes late. Um, I'm lucky I'm only five minutes late. I could have been a lot later. And I was organizing my notes, which I didn't get to finish doing, but that's all right. We got uh, got a lot of information to talk about tonight. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is July 26, 2016, and we're coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern, and you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com into the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, and SoundCloud, as well as the next day on Stitcher or iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote the ideas of true freedom and liberty as well as self-ownership, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. So I'm sitting here kind of trying to uh, (laughs) wake up. Uh, Tonight, we'll be talking all about what they called cash for kids, which uh, in thinking about it, it's a bad name because if you just hear like cash for kids, most people probably have no fucking idea unless you know what I'm talking about or you read the description to the show or something like that. You have no idea, like, what I'm talking about. You think, like, what, people are selling babies or um, something along those lines. But cash for kids had to do with a private prison paying judges. And there's only one instance that we're going to talk about, but I'm sure it went on. And all over the country, I mean, usually there's always somebody who takes the fall or who gets thrown under the bus or whatnot. But usually if something happens once, you can assure that I I don't know the percentages, but, you know, Maybe it happened 20% of the time or 20% of the judges or something like that. I don't think it's usually a majority, but it depends on what we're talking about. You know, if we're talking about politicians being liars, then, yeah, it's all of them. If we're talking about something like this... Uh, it's a little different. And judges, I, I, I can't stand judges. I, I think judges are pieces of fucking shit. And me saying that, I better be careful about not being in their courts. But 
in a way, uh, uh, there was an instance where they had power even outside their court. Uh, that I don't get. So they had uh, essentially um, during the case, Casey Anthony trial, those do, that don't know uh, Casey Anthony, she was a, well, she still is, I guess. Um, she's still alive <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> um, she was accused of killing her daughter. And for some reason, it was one of those trials that was followed all over the country. You know, you think about that, like what makes a trial one of those trials that becomes a national sensation or something like that? I mean, part of it was people thought she was cute, although I didn't think she was that cute. She was young. She had reported her daughter missing, if I remember correctly. Uh, she was out partying or something the night that either she reported her daughter missing or after her daughter was, I don't know. So you have these these trials. It's like shit on the Internet that goes viral. Like what – how do you determine what does and what doesn't? And I, I always think that, you know, I'm conspiratorial. I always think, you know, that a lot of these things happen for a reason and there's uh, things behind it. Not necessarily in this case, but I don't know. It's just a, a, a side there that who determines what the ratings well because i think also ratings factor into it barely anymore because the amount of people that for a uh show or a network to be successful has totally changed i remember uh talking about this on the show one day or just mentioning it that I don't know what show it might have been Glenn Beck said this, that Ali McBeal or something got they were talking about it getting canceled. I don't know why they were talking about Ali McBeal. Uh, for, there was some reason they were talking about it and they were saying that if it was around now, it would be like the number one show in most of its seasons but it was like number 30 or something and ended up getting uh, canceled because of that. So the point being that we have, and sometimes this is fucked up because I don't know what the fuck to watch, and I have all these channels. I mean, I pay, like, a lot of money for... And I was just going to say, I pay a lot of money for direct TV and there's a whole bunch of channels I don't even get. And I'm like, what fucking package is that that I don't get those fucking channels? Is that is that because I don't have the fucking three hundred and fifty dollar package or something? Um, they did give me a deal. Direct TV is actually customer service wise. They always get like the awards. I, I know why they get them and i'm not you know they don't pay me or anything but they they are really good when it comes to hooking you up with um deals and things like that if you're a customer for a long time like i just got i called them and i'm like my bill just went up and it's ridiculous and they're like okay we'll give you you know a six month thing where these channels will be free and we'll cut your bill. I I think it ended up getting cut by like 40 bucks or something. So that was pretty cool. And then like every two years, you know, you get a new uh, receiver because they kept upgrading their receivers where you had the original like piece of shit one. Then you had the, the DVR. Then you had the DVR that could play all around the house and, uh, all these things that they keep coming out with and 
all the ones that I've gotten, I've gotten for free because they're like, oh, you're, you know, available for an upgrade. And so they, they're they actually, I would recommend them from a customer service standpoint. Now, from a price standpoint, I don't know. I mean, probably if you got all the channels that I got on any other um company from any other company you probably play a lot of money too so it's i don't think that's direct tv i think that's the amount of channels i'm getting and i got off on a whole big thing anyway back to casey anthony so i've told this story before um mark schmitter how he ended up going to jail for almost six months based on things that were said in court uh, the judge, Judge Fuckhead, um, I forget his name, the judge on the Casey Anthony uh, case said that he couldn't hand out, um, it was violating his freedom of speech, flyers on jury nullification, and you couldn't hand it out in a certain place or to potential jurors. There was one of the counts that were overturned and there was one that wasn't but he still ended up spending six months in jail and listen to how ridiculous this is and this is in florida in orlando it's he had to pay seven dollars a day this is what yeah i didn't get this directly from him but his friend um unless he got it wrong, but he had to pay $7 a day to be in jail. And I'm like, how the fuck do you pay? So what happens when you get out of jail? Because obviously you're not making any money in jail. So if nobody's paying that money for you and you think about that, you know, $7 a day, oh, that's not a lot. Well, that's $210 a month. Now, if you're in jail for like 10 years, I mean, that, that shit can add up because um, 210 would be, what, 2,000, like almost 2,500 a year. So would they put you back in jail? Because it, this is the logic of the U.S. government and governments in general, that they would probably put you back in jail because you owe money for being in jail, and then you you would just never get out of jail because you'd never be able to pay your money back. And then they pay you, you know, 50 cents or whatever uh, a day to make license plates or some bullshit. But anyway... uh, Speaking of that all came from uh, judges, but uh, usually you have to be in their court for them to make rules. But the fact that they can make a rule in their court, you you think about that. And and as I've said, I I talked about this before and I was very uh, passionate about how fucked up I thought it was when I had talked about it before that a judge can make a ruling, not a ruling, but issue a rule, I guess, not ruling, but issue anything uh, that affects people that aren't in his court. Where's the jurisdiction? Uh, It's so... Somebody had said, I believe it was Thursday when we had, um, sorry, my mind is totally blank because I just uh, woke up um, from Leap. Uh, I, I, I feel so bad because he was such a nice guy that I can't think of his name right now. I know it starts with a B. Um but I'll think it will come to me in a second. But uh, we had him on, and 
He said something about Hillary said that the whole justice system needs to be redone and whatnot. Now, she's not thinking in the way that I am. She's thinking in the way that, uh, well, you know, make sure uh, you arrest more more white people and everything is even and bullshit like that or whatever or, you know, the type of stuff that she would think – should be reforms in the justice system would not be freedom oriented. There's just no way. But um, he had brought up that she had said something about revamping the whole justice system. And I'm like, damn, that's actually something I agree with. The, The court system is so fucked up. This whole thing that people say the greatest system in the world. Now, first of all, how can you make a statement like that? Unless you've lived in the majority of the countries in the world, or at least that have similar types of judicial systems. So, like, if... I, from what I understand, you know, the U.S. and England are probably pretty similar, and I don't, I don't know, but uh, how similar they are, um, it's not something I've studied or something, but I'm sure you could study and figure out. Okay, well, I'm going to lump these countries together, these countries together, and these countries together, and whatnot, just to get an estimation of the justice system in each of the uh, the countries in the world you'd still have to live in a lot of countries to be able to judge their justice system and i know a lot of people think well i can just read what their justice system says and that's not the case because if you read what the constitution says uh, they don't practice it. So it's, or what the laws say, uh, Dean Becker was the name of the elite member I had on um, Thursday. I'm sorry, Dean. My, I, I, As I had uh, mentioned, I, <laughs> I woke up. Uh, late, so my mind was just blank. I I knew uh, his name started with a D. He has the same uh, initials as me, DB. Um, but uh, if you missed that show, uh, go to Spreaker dot com or go to Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com, and you can actually listen to it there now too. I posted it up there, but there's a list uh, that you can find there places to listen to it. Um, the at least listen to the interview with him. It, it's about an hour, and then I do the rest of the show. But uh, he. He did a, a great job. He was entertaining. He had a lot of uh, good things to say. And, uh, I mean, those are the type of interviews I like doing, to be honest, because the show is about promoting the ideas of freedom and liberty. It's not about having people on and having arguments And, you know, yeah, if we disagree, we disagree. I had maybe one or two arguments the whole time I've done the show, and I've done the show over two years now. And one, I was trying hard (laughs) to uh, get to the point of what we were trying to talk about, and I just was like, fuck it. And I, I wasn't mean. I didn't uh get into uh insults and things like that but it had to do with the legalization it's funny it had to do with the legalization of drugs and and it was just a very ignorant person who I don't even under think he had the comprehension to be able to understand what I was saying and it was just like going in circles and it's like all right man that's it i gotta go um that interview is actually uh posted i think on youtube and in the archives as well 
It's uh, I can't remember the guy's name because I really don't give a fuck. He b- had his uh, 15 minutes of fame just because he filmed the police stop where really it wasn't even a big deal. I mean, I was abused worse by the police than he was. I just didn't have it on camera. But there was a police stop and they harassed him and, you know, nobody got beat up or dragged out of a car or anything like that. And he actually got to leave at the end, too. So it wasn't really that bad. It just showed that the police were liars and assholes and that the dog tapped on their car to search it when, you know, um, you could tell that they made the dog tap on the car so it it wasn't in the big scheme of things it was nothing compared to a lot of stuff that happens it it really wasn't but he uh tried to turn it into i'm martin luther king now or some shit and um so anyway um the point being that the show is about promoting those ideas. If you want to hear people argue, there's a lot of shows where that's what they do. They argue or debate and yell. And there used to be a show called Crossfire on uh, CNN, and it left and came back. I actually did some report on it in college. And this is the one where uh, I've mentioned this. I wanted to do a report on, uh, not a report, a presentation. Report sounds like high school. A presentation on how anytime they uh, mention guns, like how the media was trying to program how bad guns were. They've been trying to do that for 20 years at least. I remember even music-wise, they bleep any word for a gun. So I was trying to do a presentation on anytime they, uh, they the way they portray guns in the media, and and I lived in Boston at the time, and I went to uh, Emerson College, which is a it's a communication school, it's film media, it's a really good school for communications. It's not you know, top tier, but it's probably a second tier uh, school. I mean, you know, if you'd say that like USC film school or something or NYU film school is top tier, uh, like those type of schools are top tier or UCLA, it's, you know, below those obviously, but it's probably, you know, a second tier school um, below those. So it's a, it's a good school. I mean, I had to go to community college first, (laughs) to get uh my grades up and i did i i got uh geez i made dean's list uh, a couple times and even at uh, emerson i made dean's list who would have thought um people that knew knew me from when i was younger (laughs) have been like what um but anyway they my uh professor i guess even though a lot of them are professors, but you call them professors, uh, said, you know, don't do that. This is Massachusetts. People are so anti-gun. And, of course, I probably know that more better than she does because I don't think she's from Boston, and I was. I mean, I was born there and was there and until... Um, I moved 15 years ago. So at the time, obviously, I knew that. But, you know, I almost was told I can't do it. And that's kind of fucked up. Um, I didn't want to make an issue out of it, which is surprising for me. I, I think at the time it was my last semester or semester, and uh, I said semester, (laughs) my last semester, and I didn't want to have any, you know, I was working full-time, going to school full-time, and I really didn't want to make a big deal out of it and go through any 
issues or go over her head or do it anyway or report her or something. But usually I'll fight shit like that. Uh, I'll be like, well, I'm fucking doing it anyway. But uh, I didn't. I ended up doing Crossfire. So Crossfire was one of those shows where they just fucking yell at each other and you couldn't even hear what the person was saying. They're just yelling at each other and... I don't do that. That's not the point of my show. You have so many shows out there. And this is what I I tell people. They're like, well, you don't show the whole uh, view or the whole, um, you know, both sides. Well, both sides to them, number one, is Democrat and Republican. And there's a it's not just Democrat and Republican. That's not how things Uh, fucking work okay just so uh people know no i i show the side of freedom and i'm not as shy about it i I don't come off like i'm not biased in my opinion but i'm consistent in my opinion i don't follow a political party and their message and say, oh, well, if they go this way, I have to follow them and support them, which so many radio hosts do. And I could name a whole bunch, even the fucking, especially those fucking progressives that were on Sirius, man, they would just follow whatever the Democratic Party uh, said and would defend them no matter what and all this shit. So I have nobody to defend because... There's no, I'm not part of any party. I'm not part of any group. I don't have to be loyal to any group or party or anything like that. Um, I would defend someone if I believed in their principles and I believed in that principle. But if they did something that violated freedom, then I'd have to call them out on it. So I don't have any, not to say I'm not like loyal to say friends and stuff like that, but um, I'm actually a very loyal person. But my point being that if somebody says something that is not consistent with my values when it comes to defending freedom and promoting the ideas of freedom, Then I'm going to call them out on it, and I don't have to worry about uh, representing a party or representing an organization or a group. Or the only thing I represent, yeah, I represent nonpartisan liberty for all, and which which I is my little network that I put together. So, (laughs) I mean, I represent myself. You know what I you know what I mean? There's nobody else that is um running me or it or or whatever. So I I represent myself and my ideas and but anyway my point was, you know, that's what I show. If you want to hear people you wanna hear the Republican side and the the Democrat side then go watch some other show. There's tons of them. Or you just want to hear one of those sides, you know, go listen to conservative radio. Go listen to progressive radio. Go listen to whatever. Because they'll give you the opinion based on not what's in their mind, not being consistent to what they believe in their ideas, They'll give it to you based on their party or whatever organization they're a part of or whatever. And I won't. And I got into a whole long uh, conversation on this. But my point was is that uh, the interview with Dean was great because we pretty much agreed on everything we talked about. And that it's good to have a discussion which we had but to discuss uh it's i like when i'm discussing things with somebody who has the same opinion as me and maybe they might bring up something that i forgot to bring up or 
an, uh, another idea within the conversation that I also agree with. Um, so that's the to me that's a good interview you know a back and forth conversation about something that we agree with and we're both bringing up different points but points that we agree with because it's getting those ideas out there and exposing people to those ideas and that's what it was so uh, again, you can find the interview at Spreaker.com, at NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com, or just go to NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com, and there's a list on the homepage of all the applications that the interviews, not interviews, but the shows post to, um, YouTube also being a, one of them. The big ones, I think, are YouTube um not that I think uh, that I can't remember what ones are on, but I think these are the bigger ones. Um, YouTube, um, SoundCloud, and, of course, Spreaker being the main one. And then Twitter as well. You can go there, but that just connects to Spreaker, I believe. So... Uh, a lot of places where you can find the show. And, and I like that because, uh, as I was talking about, some people might be on, say, SoundCloud all the time, and that's their uh, application that they use to, say, listen to music or listen to talk radio or whatnot. Or Spreaker might be where people go. Or we were on Blog Talk Radio, and I didn't see any reason to stay on there anymore because the sound quality. And that's why I, I got rid of Blog Talk Radio anyway. I was on there for a year, and to be honest, their technology, now they're a lot more expensive, but, it, you know, you have the ability to be able to put calls on hold and take as many calls as you want if you have the $100 plan, which is what I had. And then, of course, they, you know, automatically create the files and the archives. And so you don't need a lot, you know, really for Blog Talk Radio, you need a microphone and a computer and you're all good. I did, though, you can even do it through a phone, but it doesn't sound as good. I I did, though, uh, have a lot of issues with the connection, where my connection kept going out. Now, I don't know if that was me, and I had bought a new modem since then, but it seemed like even after I bought a new modem that I'd have issues. Now, I did, I have gotten a new computer as well. So it could have been me, I don't know, but I did have a lot of issues from the connection standpoint. But as far as their functionality, um, really all they have to do is improve their sound. And I know they can do it because you do hear the professional shows on there uh, that have great sound quality. And they're paying a lot more money i think what is what it is so so that turned into about a 40 minute conversation and i still haven't got into the main topic of the show uh, sometimes i guess i can go on forever and i apologize for that and unfortunately the show i cut down the shows i was going seven to ten and I thought about starting at 6. The only problem at, about starting at 6 is that I, for two years, have been doing the show at 7 o'clock. And that's kind of, I'm sure that's ingrained into anybody who follows the show that they know it's on at 7 o'clock Pacific. Um, and I've changed the days here and there, but it's always been 7 o'clock Pacific, and it's always been weekdays 
Um, the only thing I did, well, for the first two weeks, I think it was every day that (laughs) I don't know how I did that. I did it for two weeks. I did every day. I not realizing how much goes into it. I mean, if I wanted to do a shitty show, you know, so I was doing three hours. Uh, No, I think I started doing two hours when I started. So I was doing two hours every night seven days a week and i'm like okay i can't do this one i have no life i can't go out with my fiance or go out at all and this is not easy um i'm running out of shit to say even me so i could do it five days a week it's just my job and that's what i did for a while i did it five days a week but i'm like my full-time job it's too much so i was doing it four and then i said okay and also same thing with my fiance so i have and days to spend with her sometimes she does work um those evenings but uh friday i can always stay up late anyway because i don't have to work on saturday and um you know, if she has to work Monday, then she has to work Monday. Um, but it it has turned out to be, I think, the perfect schedule uh, for now, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, where, you know, I have kind of the extra long weekends there. So I have those four days off in a row. And... I can balance that with my job, but it, don't get me wrong. I mean, doing a show even at two hours, which is a lot easier. I mean, it's to me, it's it's so much easier doing it at two hours because, like I said, I, I I have so much to say. Where doing three hours is not an issue for me. I've had some nights where I'm just not on. Um, And I'm not as good as usual. Not that I'm saying I'm good, but I'm not as uh, I'm shittier than usual. (laughs) So uh, I've had those, you know, off nights, whatever. But for the most part, I don't have a problem doing three hours. Uh, I've done shows where I've done four or five hours. I think the longest was five hours. I don't know what the fuck was in my mind uh, that day because who the fuck's going to (laughs) listen to that shit? But you never know. I mean, somebody, you can always split it up or go back or especially on YouTube now where it will go back to where you left off. So I think even on Spreaker, it will go back to where you left off. So you don't have to listen to the whole show in one sitting, even the two hour show. You know, you can listen to a half hour here and an hour here and split it up that way. But... Uh, let me get back to the main subject for tonight and uh, we'll probably end up going over because I I really need uh, this is going to take a lot of time and it might go off in some other directions and so we might go till 10 o'clock which unfortunately sleep wise um isn't good for me but uh my back has been sore the last few days since like monday and my legs so usually after the show i'll work out and do sit-ups and no big workout so i'm i'm not like oh yeah i work and you know maybe it's like 10 minutes in total but you know i'll lift some weights and do sit-ups and some jumping jacks or whatever but i think tonight i'm just gonna go right to sleep right when the show's over so well, maybe I'll go that extra hour um, to get everything in there since I just went about 45 minutes uh, and we really didn't say much about the main point of the show. So what the, what our main focus tonight is this cash for kids and like i said i wouldn't have named it cash for kids there's a documentary 
um, cash for kids. And this is only one instance of it. And I heard in other, I don't have the details, but I've heard in other clips that I was listening to or other um, YouTube um, reports of other people doing this as well. So I'm not going to get into, you know, the detail on anybody else. The folk, the focus is just this one case. However, the concept of what they did, uh, again, um, I'm sure other people did, and we can talk about that as well. But what the uh, – before we get into the details, I'll, I'll give everybody a summary. We'll take a – quick break and I'll uh, play some of the clips that I have that talk about the case to give some more information and then we'll get into the details. But what it was is I know everybody's familiar probably with these private prisons. And I want to again reiterate that I believe And things being private. And this is where people get totally fucking confused and mixed up. Because really what it is is outsourcing. And people think like, oh, making something private, that's crazy. You're you're giving the power to the corporations and they're getting government money. I I don't believe in anything being uh, set up in that way. And that's outsourcing. So, like, if you have a company and you want to outsource payroll, which a lot of companies actually do, meaning you're going to hire a payroll company like ADP and they're going to do your payroll. So you set it up where, I don't know, maybe you just enter hours into a database and they have access to that database and they process the checks. I don't know exactly how uh, payroll outsourcing works. Um, Not one of the things I got into. I started to get into a little on um, PeopleSoft HR, actually, because... I, I've done a lot with automation and, and those type of things and systems and whatnot. But but let's just say you outsource your payroll. So you obviously need to give them certain information like the Social Security number and each individual's information, their salary, the hours, whatever. So say you have it set up where you just enter the information into the system that they they have access to they process it and you know it direct deposits everything that needs to be and it sends checks to the people that it needs to send checks to so what they do is they charge you a fee to do that but you feel that it's more cost effective. So say you can hire your own people, you can buy your own system or license uh, your own software or system and have people, uh, employees that process all the payroll or you can outsource through another company. I think most companies outsource, actually, I believe. I'm trying to think of my company because I know they have a lot of payroll people. So maybe they don't outsource, but uh, I don't know. I think maybe my last company had outsourced or one of them old companies that outsourced through ADP. Anyway, that's irrelevant. And that's one of the biggest, I think, uh, payroll companies out there. So you look at the numbers and say, okay, it will save me money if I outsource payroll through ADP. You know, because like I said, otherwise... You have to hire employees. You have to uh, 
either create a system, buy a system, and then buy licenses for all the people that are going to use it to log in, depending on the type of contract you sign with the vendor of the system and all of those type of things. Um, So based on that, you determine, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pay this other company. And they obviously, you know, make money and they do it for a profit and they want to make as much money as possible. So I'm trying to compare this to the prison scenario because there are ways that prisons can hire their revenue by doing certain things. Most likely a payroll company, unless they offer, you know, they could come up with new products or, you know, I I don't know what new products they would come up with. Some kind of easier way to get your money. I don't know. Whatever. That's irrelevant, really. So anyway... It's a better business decision. You save money. You make a deal with them, whatever. So they make money, and they have contracts with a whole bunch of other companies, and that's what they do. That's their business. They're a payroll outsource company. And with prisons, they're doing a similar thing. They're outsourcing or with anything that the government is paying for, that's outsourcing because the government is taking money that they've extorted from the taxpayers. I don't even want to call them taxpayers because we're not taxpayers. We're extorted slaves um but they're taking that money and they're paying these companies i know one of them was uh was it whacking hut it was like i think it i think it is it was one of these companies that you'd order like they had magazines where you would order um you know, it was like a J.C. Penney catalog. I don't know if people remember when J.C. Penney uh, had, and I, I remember the Christmas one because my mother had a J.C. Penney credit card, and she'd get the big Christmas catalog. So every Christmas, we'd because uh, she spend a lot of money on our Christmas presents using her JC Penny credit card. Of course, Christmas, another, uh, government invented holiday to get everybody in debt. Now I say government invented because supposedly that's not even the day that Christ died and whatever. So anyway, and giving presents and Santa Claus has nothing to do with, the. Uh, the religious aspect of it neither so it is a you know government invented or whoever uh holiday but and it really all it does is get people in debt yes it's nice to spend time with your family and whatnot and but you have people that spend so much money during christmas that they're paying it back for you know, until next Christmas. Anyway, so she would, uh, she had a JCPenney credit card. And when we'd get, when we were kids and we'd get the catalog, I go, you know, right to the toy section and look at all the pages and pages of toys like GI Joe's and transformers and whatever else was in there. And, uh, as I got older, you know, Nintendo games or or whatever, clothes. Um, so what, um, how I got to that from um, the outsourcing, but what, 
the government does is instead of the people paying the money. Oh, I know how I got from that because of Wacken Hut thing. So, yeah, they had a catalog. The company, the biggest company from what I heard, they changed their name and they were uh, Wacken Hut or something, uh, I believe. And they had a similar, it wasn't as big as JCPenney, but they had like a similar catalog. So um, that's how I got into that whole thing. So anyway, that's supposedly one of the companies or the biggest company or there's more than one, just like any other business. Um, Although they're trying to make things where everything's pretty much a monopoly or a biopoly. Um, That's not really a word, but. That's what I'd call it, where, you know, two companies own basically everything. I mean, it's even happening with casinos. It's every business. You have, you know, three or four major companies that own most of the strip. It's it's sickening where before you had um, a lot of independently owned com- uh, casinos. Or maybe you'd have somebody who owned, like, two. Now it's getting kind of ridiculous where some of the companies or some of the corporations will own six or seven casinos on the Strip. That's one thing, at least, I guess, about Sheldon Adelson. Um, I know people don't like him. He's actually from Boston, and my brother met his cousin or his nephew um, because he, from what I understand, he used to be a cab driver before he became a millionaire. And um, my brother was driving a cab and um, he had talked to him about it, his cousin or uncle, whoever. Um, this guy was related to Sheldon Adelson. Anyway, Sheldon Adelson owns... Um, just Venetian and uh, the other one that's basically might as well be part of Venetian. It's uh, Palazzo, but they're like connected. It's almost, it might, they might as well be one casino, but anyway, it, at least he only owns those. And, and he does, um, I don't know if they finished them or not, but they were working on building casinos in Macayo in uh, a couple years ago. So I don't know if those were finished or they were working on building them or whatever. Uh, Anyway, so getting back to the outsourcing. So outsourcing is when you actually take your money or in this case, the government, takes the money that it stole from everybody and pays another company to handle something for them as opposed to them taking that money and having their own employee, hiring their own employees and running it themselves. So a lot of companies outsource um, and... Unfortunately, a lot of it goes to other countries um, where, like, when I worked at Avery Denison, they outsourced a whole bunch of shit to India. There's a lot of stuff that's being outsourced to India. And this is not even um, – this is it got kind of scary because it wasn't just – like the mindless kind of shit, like call centers, because it started with, I believe, at least on the office side, it started with call centers. They have, in, in, you know, when you call a call center and they're in some other country, I know they train, they train them to, uh, talk without an accent and shit and uh, oh yes I'm in Colorado it's very sunny and hot here in December yes um, but it's um, 
they'd outsource parts of the business. And Avery Dennison outsourced all their general accounting, um, all of their AP and AR and a whole bunch of shit, as well as any of um, the call center stuff. I don't know what they did regarding uh, call centers because they had so many different types of businesses. Avery Dennison, they had... Like, they made office supplies. I think they stopped actually making the office supplies and bought them and just put the stickers on them. So it said Avery Dennison. They made, like, this sticky fucking tape. They're also one of the ones who did RFID. They bought this company called, uh, was it Paxar? And that's when I started to work for them. They had just bought Paxar. And um, I didn't work for them that long because they ended up closing the Vegas office. So it was only a couple of years. And they bought them for that technology. But I don't know what happened with um, Avery Dennison in terms of their uh, RFID technology and at the time they bought it it was like right before the economy crashed because i started there in 2008 in february and then of course while i was there that was when the whole housing market thing had happened but they uh, were one of the companies that uh at least paxar was and then they redone some bottom that was really in the RFID. Now, I don't know if they got into like government type contracts and things like that, but their purpose was for shipping that when you ship products to somebody, they don't have to uh, enter in any information or anything like that. Once it comes through, it will register in your system that you received it. And then if something goes out, you know, it will register that it goes out. More of an inventory type tracking system was how I kind of looked at it. But, um, yeah, RFID is a whole another scary technology, although... The last I looked at RFID, and they may have modified it to make it a lot more powerful, but it was just, like I said, something would register, but it it only had a radius of like, you know, geez, 50 feet or something. I mean, it wasn't that far. And I know they were looking at putting it in passports. So, you know, when you got to where you were going, it would kind of register it that way. But the U.S. would, of course, have to force all these other countries to adapt to technology. But it, when you're coming back to the U.S., it would pick it up. So, um, but I don't know. Anyway, uh, my point was is that there's a difference between outsourcing and privatizing. And the difference to me is when the government outsources, which is all they do, is, and when I say it's all they do, I mean compared to privatizing. They don't privatize anything Really, they pretty much outsource. And maybe there's something they privatized. I doubt it because maybe in the history of the country, but, I mean, that's not the direction they're going. They're trying to control everything. So outsourcing doesn't really, uh, I don't believe they lose control of anything because they're the ones just paying another company to do their work and it's actually i think a benefit for them 
they probably not only save money, but they uh, give contracts to corporations, and it's just a whole benefit to them. And with prisons, it's definitely something that you should not hand over to a private company. Now, so outsourcing is the government taking the money that, of course, they uh, extorted from you, giving it to the whack and hunt or whatever the fuck they're called now company that runs the prison and they make a deal and say, okay, we'll pay you blah, blah, blah. And you uh, will run the prison for us. Now, the reason I think with prisons is it's really bad. In general, I think it it is uh, a bad thing. I think it's worse than having the government run something. Because in a way, they can put uh, responsibility onto the company. Even though, yes, they were the ones who went with that company, but it gives them some deniability. So that's number one. And privatizing prisons giving them that deniability and letting a private company kind of come up with the rules that they want, the people they want to hire, the type of people they want to hire, and whatever philosophy they have about how prison should be run or how shitty they are or how they cut corners to save money is not a good thing. So they're outsourcing prisons as opposed to what I believe in is privatizing basically almost everything because if you got rid of government, you privatize stuff. So in the case of the police, I mentioned that I want to and the government police, and I have a Facebook page and the government police. So that wouldn't be outsourcing. It would be totally private because people would go and find a company if they wanted to. They wouldn't have to. They could, if they felt that they could defend themselves, then they could do that as well. But they could find a security company best to, you know, their liking based on price, based on service, whatever. And philosophy, how they run their company, you know. Like I've noticed with security guards, you have the wannabe cops. And I can't stand these guys. I I, want to smack them. And you can tell, you can even look at them and tell. And some of the older guys were former cops. Um, There's a guy that I'll just say at my work that I believe he's a former cop. And he may not be. He may just be totally a wannabe fucking cop. And I hate when they dress... uh, this is what really fucking pisses me off about security guards as well, uh, is they, they'll they dress them up like police and give them a badge. And it it's like, you know how people will say, you know, how you're dressed can affect your mood or your actions or and and it can it's like if you're dressed in a suit going to somewhere elegant you might act a little different than if you're dressed in like jeans and a t-shirt or something not that it changes your personality or anything I'm just saying that 
it you're more in a in that type of mind state. So these guys, I think it does that where they're walking around. They got batons and they got a badge and and, and they look like fucking cops, basically that are getting paid, you know, twelve bucks an hour, but they're, they're still. Uh, they think like they're cops and they're just fucking security, which can be dangerous, especially if they're armed. Um, but I hate when they dress them up like that. I'd rather, you know, give them a jacket that says security or give them something, a shirt or something like that, that just says security on it. If, if you want people to, um, know that their security don't fucking dress them up like police because that's just ridiculous. But anyway, so, um, regarding the police. So I, I always bring up the Detroit threat management center because they, uh, have a totally, and that was where the philosophy came in. And it has to come from the top where you have Dale Brown, um, who I did a message and he said that he would come back on the show. Uh, I haven't heard back from him. Um, I'll follow up and hopefully he he will. I also uh, mentioned that we had talked about before maybe doing a reoccurring, you know, whatever he wants to do based on his availability. So if he wanted to do reoccurring once every couple months, because that's all he has time for, that's fine. But I'd be willing to do, you know, probably once a week um, or at least every two weeks, um, you know, if that's something that he wanted to do. But, uh, and I had also mentioned if he was interested in possibly doing his own show, you know, not anything too long, maybe like an hour or something like that. Or if he wanted to, to, to do a half hour, that would be fine where he could talk about, uh, his business and what's going on. And I know he wants to expand at some point, so uh, that may help him. Of course, I got to get my uh, visibility of my channel and network and whatnot up, but uh, it may be helpful to him as well. So he had said yes, and then I sent him back uh, any a Facebook message, and I haven't heard back from him. So um, I'll follow up with him either tonight or tomorrow. So um, he was great when he was on the show before. Uh, again, you can find that uh, on Spreaker. All the archives are on Spreaker. For the uh, um, other applications, it depends on when I started those. But Spreaker, if you want, and, and it wasn't that long ago because I was in the studio I'm in now when I had him on. And I've only lived here, I think we moved in November 2014, and I think it was the beginning of uh, 2015, was it November 2014? Yeah, it had to be. So it must have been, um, it might have been like December or something, uh, but... But anyway, so um, he should be coming on sometime in the near future. Um, but my my point my point is is that everyone would provide for their own security, so they wouldn't be paying whatever tax goes to the government. You wouldn't be paying that tax because they wouldn't be providing. A police force there would be as the need arises just with anything else there would be security companies and there could be some sort of a transition or whatnot 
you know. Um, but I think ultimately the philosophy of a company, like I would like to see these companies have the type of dedication and training and philosophy of Dale's company because it's not about just going home safe. That's not what they're about. And their rule was that they could not fire upon somebody until they were shot at first. For one, they didn't have any extra special rights like the police do. They couldn't just shoot somebody and get away with it. Um, So that was one of the reasons. The other reason was, uh, and he had said this on the show, you know, obviously if that's your procedure, you're never going to shoot anybody who doesn't have a, a real gun. And at the same time, I think that's how it should be for police as well. If you're going to sign up for that job, um, if you're going to be a cop, you know, and cops pay at least, you know, I can't speak to other areas of the country. But, of course, if you're in a small town and nothing really happens, you know, I'm sure your salary is a lot less. But in Las Vegas, um, you can view all of the salaries, and and really, I mean, they're making eighty, ninety thousand a year. Most of these guys, um, and some of them are making a lot more. It depends how long they've been with the police department. Now, if they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, then I don't know that I would have as much as a issue with it as I do. But the other side of that is I don't think they should exist, period. So what people would do is they would go out and find the security company that's best for them. They would get special attention. They would get, like, Dale's company uh, drives women to court. He's done stuff like that. They've sat outside their house and, you know, watched for anything going on. They've, I think, even stayed at the house um, to protect people. And uh, and, and a lot of uh, these events, they've done it for free because they didn't have the money. And they have, um, what do you call it, contracts with all these big corporations. So they make money that way. So they're able to help people out that can't afford it. And it doesn't mean just because somebody said, oh, I can't afford it. I mean, they, you know, they can tell who can't afford it and who can. But they, at the same time, give you that actual protection and safety uh, that the police would not do. They give you that actual attention that the police would not do. You know, you're an actual person to them. You're a life. And you're a life that they want to continue to keep on living. And they treat other people's lives the same way. I remember a statement from Dale before. If somebody was running out of a house with uh, a TV and he arrived on the scene and the guy's running away, um, he's not going to fucking shoot him just over a TV. Um, If he can catch him, maybe he'll he'll chase him, you know, and get their TV back or whatnot. But he's not going to shoot somebody over that and kill someone over over a TV, you know. So, um, and most people have homeowner's insurance anyway. So something like that, a break-in, you know, should be covered 
anyway. So they hold life. They actually value life is what it is. Now, at the same time, if somebody else, the person they're protecting's life is in danger from a criminal and the only way to save their life is to kill them, then I'm sure they would do that. But that would be a last resort. And they're trained to be able to, uh, there's videos of this on YouTube. I mean, their training is extensive, so they're able to uh, use all these defensive moves and things like that. And like I said, now they don't even have guns. Um, At least that was the last time I had talked to Dale. He said that as of 2015, they weren't going to use guns anymore. Maybe they went back to them. I don't know. But they have other weapons. Um, But that's not their focus. I mean, again, their focus is on whoever they're protecting, whoever, uh, depending on the situation, keeping them safe. And at the same time, doing it without taking somebody else's life. Now, again, if they had to, if they're protecting somebody and the person they're protecting them from somehow got in a position where the only way that they could save that person is they would have to kill them, then I'm sure they would and they should in that situation because you're saving an innocent life. But outside of that, really, um, when I had talked to them, they had never killed anybody. I don't even think they've ever shot anybody. Because they're prepared for their training is and and Dale came up with this and and there he's a he's a really um I, I don't know what words I'd use to describe him but I mean it, he puts uh you know came up with this whole thing It's not like he came from, you know, uh, a poor family or anything. Um, He could have, I think he did go to college, but he could have, you know, easily done something else and been successful. But he was dedicated to wanting to help people. And he came up with this great training program, you know, with influences from different, I think, uh, forms of self-defense and all of these things. And yeah, I mean, he's a great guy. I had the opportunity of, uh, you know, talking to him on the show, but as I had mentioned, uh, before I talked to him, uh, when I pre-interviewed him and then I talked to him after the show for like a couple hours, we just, you know, we're talking and he was telling me all, all this stuff uh, that was going on and, and things like that. And, and so I got into a whole big long thing on that. But the point being is that what the government does is outsource. And then they call it privatization. And then people like the progressives or um, people in general, I guess, look at that as, oh, that's privatization. And no, it's not. It's outsourcing. Privatization is getting the government out of it. So an easier example uh, or a simpler example is trash. And uh, 
Mark Edge from uh, Free Talk Live, who I had mentioned uh, was in town, was it last week? And um, I got to, uh, not for that long, because they were uh, leaving the next day, but got to see him and, and, and his wife uh, for a little while. And and he sang karaoke, and uh, I guess it didn't come up on the fucking YouTube where I can see it and he can see it, but other people can't see it, so I got to go and try to fix that. But anyway, um, he talked about his town and them privatizing the trash. So you can go and have you know you pay a certain amount a month to a company and they take your trash away but it has nothing to do with the government it's not money you pay to the government and then they pay no it's you take your money your bill that way your bill directly and you cut out the government and that's where there's so many things that you can get the government out of And it's just a, you know, you have competition because one of the things that you have when the government runs things like the police is they have a monopoly on force. And, of course, they get special rights and special treatment because they're part of the government and they're run by the government. And the government, uh, they're there to essentially uh, do a job for the government and enforce their fucking ridiculous laws. So so I've been going on for a while here. So we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll get into the details of what happened with these judges and how what they did was lock kids up, put kids in juvenile detention that shouldn't have been, and got kickbacks for it. At the same time, you had police in schools that were policing things that should have been handled by the schools that were... When I was in school, they had police handling it and then it going to the court. So things that were getting uh, pretty crazy. So we will be back after this nonpartisan liberty for all. Uh, Just to mention, if you had missed it yesterday, the Illumination Hour, which airs every Monday, 7 o'clock Pacific, with Ellen Stallone, who hosts and produces, you can go to Spreaker and a lot of the other same uh, applications, SoundCloud, YouTube, and uh, listen to the show. And she does a great show. She came up with a totally different and unique idea that's creative and e- even if you if you haven't heard the show, you know, check it out. If it's not for you, it's not for you. But I think that if you listen to the show and give it a chance, uh, you might really like it and, and want to go back and listen to uh, all the shows you missed. There's eight shows now, and those are all on Spreaker as well as the other applications. So you can go and start with episode number one if you want or start with uh, yesterday's episode or start wherever you want and uh, listen to those shows. And and Ellen's very talented. She used to co-host with me once a week or every other week. Uh, She's been on Free Talk Live, uh, Ladies of Keen. Uh, she's been on a bunch of shows, but this is the first show that she's done by herself that she has complete control over. Whereas the other shows that she did, she had co host and she had to decide with them, you know, what they do and whatnot, 
whereas this show um she can do whatever she wants and that i think was important to her to you know do a show and do a show by herself where she didn't have to argue with somebody or not that she ever argued with her co-host i'm not saying that but you know get kind of agree on oh, okay this is the the topic we're gonna do and all of those things where she can just go and pick whatever she wants to do and go and do it and of course if you'd like to call in you can call in at 702-470-7664 that's 702-470-7664 or you can skype into the show username nonpartisan liberty for all and all of that information, if you forget any of it, is at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, uh, plus our links to our social media pages. Uh, I post every weekend the archives. There's various uh, things there. There's uh, articles, uh, blogs, all of uh, those types of things are there. As I had mentioned, I'm still working on the uh series the article slash blog series on the legalization legalization of drugs and bringing it back how it was before 1914 which is when they passed the harris act so we'll be back after this nonpartisan liberty for all these disturbing images went viral, the spotlight focused not only on the now-fired sheriff's deputy and his actions, but also on the role of school resource officers in the nation's schools. Should he have ever been called there? I just want to make a point here. Uh, school resource officers, and uh, I was going to make this point when we got into the detail, but since they brought it up here, and I'll probably bring it up again, they don't call them cops, of course. They are cops. It's not they're technically cops. They're, no, they're cops that happen to work at the school. And let me bring this back to the beginning because I think I didn't turn it up until uh, I think I missed a part there. But they are cops. That's what they are. They are not school resource officers or whatever they want to fucking call them uh, to make it sound like they're not cops. And I think that's exactly why they do it, because they don't want it to sound like, you know, hey, there's cops in the school. No, there's student resource officers. So... Since these disturbing images went viral, the spotlight focused not only on the now-fired sheriff's deputy and his actions, but also on the role of school resource officers in the nation's schools. Should he have ever been called there? You know, that's something we're going to talk to the school district about. Maybe that should have been something handled uh, by the teacher and that school administrator without ever calling the deputy. Former Deputy Ben Fields was called to the classroom after the 16-year-old student refused repeated requests to leave by both her teacher and a school administrator. Resource officers are used as a law enforcement tool in some schools. Just this week in Sacramento, a resource officer called to help break up a fight involving about a dozen students. The school's principal tossed during the fight. Police ended up arresting three teenagers. Breaking up school fights or trying to manage a defiant student are part of a resource officer's duties, but it is not all of that officer's responsibilities. We want them involved in informal counseling within the context of their job, really getting to know students and building relationships with them. Part counselor, part enforcer, According to the National Association of School Resource Officers, their numbers grew in the late 80s under the D.A.R.E. program developed to help children stay away from drugs and violence. And they shot a few more times. and all Growing more following the shooting in Columbine, Colorado in 1999 after schools felt a need to have access to armed officers. Now some 82,000 SROs are working full or part-time at 43% of public schools. And with more officers, more cameras, 
comes more scrutiny. A school resource officer in Kentucky faces federal charges for handcuffing two misbehaving children with disabilities. In this video, a third grade boy struggles with the cuffs. And now in South Carolina, an officer fired from his job and under a federal investigation that could result in even more punishment. What if we as a nation came to realize that the quest for empire eventually destroys all great nations? Hey, welcome back everyone. I am Matt Larson and some shocking news. Former Pennsylvania judge Mark Ciavella Jr. has been sentenced to 28 years in prison for basically selling kids to a prison system, for a for-profit prison system. Uh, basically what happened is he was taking money illegally by the person who went around and built these juvenile detention systems and he would actually deny them their civil rights and go and sentence them to two, three weeks, four or five months, whatever each, each individual case was, to spend time in this for-profit system. Now, in addition to his prison sentence, uh, Sierra Varela was ordered to pay nearly $1.2 million in restitution. Uh, some of the most shocking cases, now, when you actually go and you listen to some of the things that the judge sentenced these people for, uh, some of his victims were 15-year-old Hillary Tranus, uh, who was sentenced to three months in juvenile detention center for basically mocking an assistant principal, for mocking someone, for using their First Amendment rights. Since when is being disrespectful a crime? I understand uh, that if you go and you threaten someone and you kind of raise your hand and you're about to hit them and you just hold it there, you know what, sure, uh, you should probably teach that person a little bit of manners. I still don't think that it is something that you can send a person to jail or even threaten them with fines and taxation for. I don't believe in that. Uh, maybe you could give them a verbal reprimand for that, sure. But sending them to a juvenile detention center, no thank you. <laughs> you know, there's, there's wrong and there's right. We understand that. Now, many people go out there and do wrong things that they need to go to jail for. Absolutely not. And now this whole d uh, discussion that you could have on privatizing jails and prisons or making them public owned, that is a whole different discussion. Uh, to where we can see in the free market system where there can be some corruption where a person that does build jails that are private prisons could go and try to buy off a judge like this happened and you could have the corruption take place there but that is a completely different case that you can talk about down in the description or down in the comment section if you like uh, to me this is mind-boggling on how many probably other cases there are exactly like this where judges are getting paid off and it's almost like a mafia coming in and stealing your kids for profit. It's sickening. We have CPS workers doing this in Sacramento and I'll have another special story actually talking with the family of a story very similar to ones that I put out videos on yesterday where their son was taken from them and they're still fighting to get them back. So stay tuned for Friday. I'll have a very amazing interview that I'm doing on Wednesday, and I want to make sure we do a good job on this and we get it out to you by Friday. But for now, if you guys want to read more into the story, I'll have the full article down below in the description. I ask that you guys please thumbs up this video, share it with friends and family. If you're new to my videos, make sure you click that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all the current political news. As always, I'm Matt Larson. Go Ron Paul. Peace. By now you've probably seen this video of Officer Ben Fields throwing a student to the ground in South Carolina. Now the question many are asking is, why are there police officers in schools anyway? There are as many as 20,000 cops working in schools across the country. They're called school resource officers. And what happened in South Carolina isn't a one-off. There were protests in Rhode Island after this officer slammed a 15-year-old student to the ground. The ACLU filed a federal lawsuit after this officer handcuffed a third grader. In 2012 alone, the police arrested more than 64,000 students. Police officers were first introduced into the American school system during desegregation. But towards the late 90s, and especially after the Columbine shooting in Colorado, things began to change. Around the country, there were calls for more police to protect students. 
The Justice Department then spent $750 million to add 6,500 more cops into schools. This was also the dawn of zero-tolerance school policies, which were supposed to keep guns and drugs out of schools. But over time, these policies have extended to petty high school drama, like students throwing tantrums, disobeying teachers, or fighting. Instead of just being there for safety, school police have gotten involved in discipline. That means arrests instead of just detention. And that has disproportionately affected black and Latino students. In fact, 31% of those arrested in 2012 were black students, even though they only make up 16% of the student population. When 26 people were shot dead at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012, President Obama allocated $125 million more to add additional police officers into schools. But experts say there's little evidence that they improve safety. What they do know is that police and schools funnel more minors into the criminal justice system, the so-called school-to-prison pipeline. The South Carolina officer has been fired, but maybe it's time to ask, does having cops in schools do more harm than good? This is John W. Whitehead, author of Battlefield America, The War on the American People, bringing you a message about the state of our nation. If you were a leader, or let's say an oligarchy, that controlled government, you want to control the future of the country. You want to make sure that people lined up when you wanted to line up. Salute when you wanted to salute. Go to war when you want to go to war. Never question too much. No protest because protest, free speech, stuff like that can cause a little havoc. You don't want that. You want order. You want to go to the store, buy things, and make sure the economy moves forward. How do you make sure that these people will never revolt or question things like people in the past have? How would you control that? Where would you start? Basically, where leaders of the past who have erected regimes start, they start in the schools. They start with controlling the minds of young people. We're seeing that very thing happen in the United States today. There are 98,000 public schools, just to focus on the public schools where we're seeing many of the problems I'm going to be talking about. What are we seeing in those public schools today? From the moment a child enters one of the nation's 98,000 public schools to the moment a student graduates. They're exposed to a steady diet of zero tolerance policies that are very draconian, that even criminalize childish behavior, overreaching anti-bully laws that criminalize speech, school resource officers or policemen walking the halls who are tasering, disciplining, or arresting so-called disorderly students. You have standardized testing that emphasizes rote answers over critical thinking. You have a politically correct mindset that teaches young people to censor themselves and those around them. And now extensive biometric and surveillance systems that, coupled with the rest of the stuff we're talking about, acclimate young people to a world in which they have no freedom of thought, speech, or movement. By the time a young person graduates from public school in this country, nearly one in three have been arrested. Over three million are expelled alone in the United States on an annual basis. Let me give you an example. A Virginia sixth grader, he was the son of two public school teachers. He was a member of the school's so-called gifted program. He was suspended for a year after school officials found a leaf, which they thought might have been marijuana in his backpack. Come to find out, it was not marijuana, a fact that the school officials knew almost immediately. But the 11-year-old 11, the 11 kid was still kicked out of school. He was charged with marijuana possession in juvenile court. He was enrolled in an alternative school away from his friends. He was subjected to twice daily searches for drugs and forced to be evaluated for substance abuse programs. Kids are actually being kicked out of school for so-called imitation controlled substances such as breath mints, oregano, powdered sugar. Then there are the crazy zero tolerance policies against weapons. To give an example of a case that I actually worked on at the Rutherford Institute, a little boy named Johnny Jones in Ohio, right before Christmas a couple years ago, walked up to the teacher's desk. What did he do? He got a piece of paper. On his way back, his best friend in class went, didn't make a sound. These are fourth graders, by the way, 10-year-olds. 
Our uh, client, Johnny Jones, responded by doing a bow and arrow. He shot a bow and arrow. He'd seen the movie Brave. The teacher saw him do the bow and arrow, the fake bow and arrow, no sound, by the way. He was just goofing around with his buddy. He was taken outside the class and charged, believe it or not, in the principal's office with a criminal violation of, of the school's zero tolerance policy. What? He had a weapon. Ridiculous, of course. Uh, we intervened. Uh, got some good media. Media that people in the media thought this was crazy, and it was crazy. Finally, the school backed off and took this off his record. Again, if someone hadn't stepped in, though, and this is how crazy things are looking in the schools, he would have had uh, on his record for the rest of his life a weapons violation. Even acts of kindness can get you in trouble in the schools today. One 13-year-old kid was given detention for exposing the school to liability for sharing his lunch with a hungry friend. A third grader was suspended for shaving her head in sympathy for a friend who had lost her hair to chemotherapy. And then there was the high school senior who was suspended for saying, bless you, after a fellow classmate sneezed. And now in recent years, we've seen the proliferation of school resource officers walking the hallways of schools. In other words, police officers equipped with weapons, tasers, all kinds of dangerous weapons. And what we're seeing is a number of cases, kids getting punched in face for so-called insubordination, all because of so-called childish behavior, something that I never saw when I was in school. In fact, in my school, I never saw police officers walking the hallways. I'm a former infantry officer. When we guarded the base, an infantry officer is fighting war, that's what I did, and I trained troops to fight in war. We guarded the base from the outside. We knew that if someone was going to get into a base, they had to be stopped from the outside. We didn't put armed guards inside the post, always ruling really, and, and trying to control the troops. We knew that the threat was on the outside. A better resource here would be to put, you know, if you want armed guards outside the school to keep a crazy, uh, occasional crazy shooter, you do that. But when you put these officers inside the schools, patrolling the schools looking for child's behavior, you're going to get people arrested. You're going to get people with criminal records who, by the way, should never even be touched by a police officer. What this has created is a problem called the school to prison pipeline. Indeed, one study found that being suspended or expelled made a student nearly three times more likely to come into contact with the juvenile justice system within the next year. Nearly 40% of those young people who are arrested, believe this or not, will serve time in a private prison where they'll make products for multi-corporations. Some schools that have had a lot of cops walk in the hallways, and this is proven, have removed the policemen inside the hallways generally. Kept a few maybe, but got rid of most of them who are watching for childish behavior. In some cases, believe it or not, in inner city schools, Kids getting arrested, charged, and put in the juvenile system has dropped by 90%. 90%. So what am I saying here? Is it a good idea to have policemen walking the halls looking for kids arguing, debating a teacher, getting slammed down on their face for uh, arguing with a cop in a school, getting in trouble, getting a, a, a thing on their record, a, a something a charged for simply cutting in line in the cafeteria? Is that what we want? And here's the other problem I see. We're acclimating kids to live in a police state. That's obviously what we're seeing. They're afraid to move. They're afraid to say the wrong word now these days. They're afraid to point their finger and play cops and robbers like all kids used to do on the playground. Because why? Because they'll get in trouble. They'll get a criminal record. They might even get arrested for it. I mean, if you, if you bring oregano in for pizza day to put on your pizza, watch out. You might get a criminal record. You might get arrested and thrown out of school, even though you're not guilty of something. So what are we doing to the kids? We're making them stop thinking, debating. Uh, we're, go we're stopping them from being citizens. If we want a free citizenry, then let's treat them like free citizens. Let's not put them in prisons, what we call schools, where cops are walking the hallways and arresting and slamming them down or even tasering them and sometimes shooting them. Is that what we want in America? It's time to wake up, folks. It's if we don't change this system, I'm afraid we're going to repeat history. And when we wake up one day, we're going to go, what happened to our freedom? For more information about the Rutherford Institute, promoting the ideas of true freedom and liberty, nonpartisan liberty for all radio with Dave Bourne. Nonpartisan uh, non liberty for all. That was too loud. Sorry about that. Uh, and we are back. 
Check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com where we have lots of stuff for you to check out. So in those clips, uh, one of them did mention how one of the judges that we'll be talking about went to jail for 28 years. Part of that was because he didn't plead out. If he would have took the plea, I believe he would have uh, got a lot less time. And he's old, so he's probably going to die in jail, which he probably deserves to. I'm not saying he deserves to die, but I'm saying he deserves to spend the rest of his life in jail. So let's uh, get into this since I spent so much time uh, babbling about other things. So first of all, you now have police in schools, and that was, I think most people know that. And that was made uh, evident also in one of those clips about all of these things that have happened in which were results of having police in schools. If they had police in schools when I went to school, I wouldn't have gone to school. I don't know how I would have gotten around that. But there's no way. Um, they did have police show up at my high school a couple times. But, and um, I think one time they showed up with dogs. But it was more, they were called for some fucking reason and they had come by it wasn't on a regular basis. We didn't have whatever they fucking, the bullshit name that they call them, student resource officers or anything like that. So, you know, if you got in a fight, you wouldn't be arrested for assault. Um, if you, you know, any of those things that they talked about, that cops are are actually prosecuting people for or arresting them for and then the the county or state is prosecuting them for would never happen in when I was in school now the only things i can see maybe drugs would um especially back then they may call the police if they found drugs in a locker or something like that. Or if you, you know, beat somebody so bad that you hospitalize them. Um, I don't know how bad you'd have to beat somebody for them to call the police. I guess technically the family could still sue, but still that's civil and that has nothing to do with the school so or the police in, in that uh, case. So, um, you know, there were fights in school all the time and nobody, people got suspended and that's about it. But no one ever got arrested and no one ever got arrested for any of these ridiculous things. So I would think, again, the only thing that people would get arrested for is probably drugs. And, of course, if you killed somebody or, you know, stabbed them or something like that. But fights, you know, the fight is a fight. It was, I mean, since the beginning of time, people have been getting in fights in schools. It's just part of being in school, I guess. So this judge, um, and I don't know if you know if I'm saying his name right, Mark Civarella, he was elected twice. He was elected in 1995 because I guess the position that he held as juvenile justice 
uh, or juvenile, I think that's what they called it, juvenile justice, um, or the judge of juvenile justice court. It was in Pennsylvania in Luzerne County in Wilkes Barry. All these weird fucking names to pronounce. So that's where he was a judge. And he was elected first in 95. And then he was elected again in 2005. So I guess they're 10 year terms. People uh, had praised him and thought he was uh, cleaning things up and he was doing a great job and all of this stuff. Uh, which is ridiculous. It shows one of the things that I got out of this. And I mean, I knew this already, but it just it makes me think about it more is how ignorant or naive people are to the injustice system. And how it really works, because you had uh, a girl who, um, well, I'll go into the specifics on that one later. It was just these people were getting screwed over, but none of them knew their rights or anything. And I don't know if that would have made a difference, because, again, Courts are going to do whatever the fuck they want to do. The government in general is going to do whatever they want to do. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to get away with uh, all of those things within this town. So there was another judge, and, and it was a bit confusing But I believe the other judge, because they had said that, or maybe it it was Mark uh, Silver, whatever his name is, but there was another judge who became president of the judges. I don't know what the fuck that means. I guess he was the head judge, I would say. Um, And I'm looking for his name because I have it written down. And he ended up going to jail as well. But he was a businessman, and I wasn't clear on if it was him who brought in the guys and negotiated, or it was the other guy. If it was uh, this guy, Mark. But the other judge, or nevertheless, one of them or both of them helped negotiate to build a private prison. Michael Conan was the other judge. And he was the, they said he was the president judge. So, excuse me, it was one of these judges knew uh, had a bunch of businesses, and I think it was Michael Conan who had a, a bunch of businesses and had connections to people t- that helped this deal get put together where they actually built a private prison and their whole thing was, well, the current prison, you know, was shit. And I think it was Mark Severella who was pushing it. So it, it might have been his friend There was one guy that was friends with one of them. I think it was him who that's what he did. Um, He might have been a building contractor or something like that. And he was the one who got the contract, got it built. And there was a scene where Mark said that because, you know, the current jail we have now, you know, is shitty and whatever. So this this guy, this judge, would go to schools in the county and he would tell them about this no-tolerance policy. Now, he was elected in 95. In 99 was Columbine. 
in Colorado, those who aren't familiar with it, which I'm sure everybody was, was where I believe it was four uh, kids that I don't know the exact number who shot up uh, high school. And I think it was the first like major uh, high school shooting um, you had in Texas in the 60s. The guy who was uh, he killed like 20 people at the University of Texas where he's, he's shooting people um, off a roof or tower somewhere um, with a rifle basically set up as a sniper. So this was, you know, of course at the time, a huge thing. And they took this one incident and of course this is what they do. And even now, regardless of what people want to fucking say, your chances of getting killed in a school shooting are not, uh, you know, are probably the same as, you know, being struck by lightning. They're not, um, sorry, I'm making all this noise. They're not, uh, like likely that it's going to happen, even though people will cite, well, there's all these schools. Sh- they, they miss, first of all, they misrepresent the amount of school shootings. The other thing is, they fail to recognize, um, and and it doesn't matter even if you count these the way they count them, but a lot of times, and years ago, they wouldn't even count these, like if they happened in a bad area where someone would bring a gun to school and they targeted a specific person. And that happens all the time, but they count those as like mass shootings or something. Uh, because occasionally a bullet, you know, they're not good shots and another person will get killed or hit or something like that. Um, But with all that, it's still, your chances are still very low. And at that time, they were definitely very low. So he looks at this one shooting in Columbine, Colorado. It's not like it was, you know, down the street from him or even in the same state. He's looking at a shooting, you know, 2,000 miles away. And he might have already had this mentality prior anyway to this. And I think this is after Columbine, and I didn't know this, this is where I guess Eric Holder, and I don't think he was the, uh, I know he was involved in the Clinton administration. So yeah, Clinton was president in 99. Because they mentioned Eric Holder, but he wasn't the attorney general, I don't believe, but he was the, he was one of the, um, what do they call them? They have like a bunch of them. The, uh, I don't know, they have a bunch of like people that work for the attorney general all over the uh, country. And Eric Holder... I think he might have been the assistant attorney general, actually. But they got $750 million to give to uh, communities to hire police in the schools. So it sounds like after Columbine, like they do with so many other things... Is they're like, oh, something happened. We have to show whether they believe that it's a threat to them or not, which most of the time they know it's not, but they have to show that they're doing something. So what they do is they go and 
you know, they do something to show the government's being active and they're doing something about it. So they gave $750 million to schools in the U.S. And this Mark Silverilla, uh, Mark Gorilla, whatever the fuck his name is, he would go around to schools and, you know, make speeches. Like, if you remember ever having, I'm sure everybody does, you know, you go in the auditorium and the principal or uh, you'd have a guest speaker or whatever would make a speech to the whole fucking school. Although I don't remember that happening in high school. Not to say it didn't. I'm just trying to remember if we had an auditorium and where it was. (laughs) Maybe in the gym um, they'd do it. But... He went around and he said, if you end up in my courtroom, you are going to jail. And that's it. So, and he wasn't kidding. He wasn't trying to scare anybody. I mean, he was trying to scare them, but I mean, he wasn't saying it just to scare people. He was dead serious. He was there saying that, yes, if you end up in my courtroom, I'm going to put you in jail. So he talked about this, you know, uh, no tolerance policy, which they have now still at a lot of schools that these schools talk about it. And it's the most ridiculous thing. It's similar to the mandatory sentencing is how I see it. Schools that have no tolerance policy. Like if you do something, you get expelled. And it doesn't matter what the reason or excuse is. No matter what you get expelled. I'm just using that as an example. Or whatever the punishment is for doing something. So the schools all got stricter for the most part. At least these schools did, and I'm sure schools all around the country, to again show, you know, because parents that are ignorant-minded are right away, well, there was a shooting here. Because the the point is, before that, there was always a chance that something like that could have happened. And that's really what I don't get in a way, is that all these things that happened, before they had happened... There was always a chance that something like that could happen. And I'm talking about the parents now. I know why the government, you know, does something about it, because that gives them their opportunity to take more control. One, they have to show that they're doing something about it. Two, it gives them their opportunity to take more control. And one of the places, of course, they want to take as much control as possible is the school. Because in a school, that's where they're brainwashing the future. That's where they're trying to teach all these kids how to be in the future or condition them for things and indoctrinate them and all of that. So when it comes to schools, the more control they have, the better for the government. So I know why the the government benefits from it, but I'm talking about the parents. So the schools themselves... 
sit there and I'm sure get calls from parents. Well, there was a shooting in this school, so what are you going to do to make sure there's never a shooting in your school? And really, if you want to look at the the reality and the facts of it, again, like a lot of things, if you actually want to maintain freedom and they believe that in, you know, a school because you're under 18, you not only don't have freedom from your parents, you don't have freedom in society, period. So they don't give a fuck about you. They'll do whatever they want to you. So they get calls from parents and they say, well, how are you going to, you know, whatever. Oh, well, we're going to get police in the schools and uh, have a zero uh, tolerance policy. You know, any kid that does anything that we think might uh, point to them being some kind of uh, violent person, we're just going to expel them. Like a kid, you know, pointing uh, his hand like a gun. We'll just uh, get rid of them. It, it's just crazy. But so he went around and told everybody that. So whatever. So they got this, uh, you know, private juvenile prison, which I don't know if it was like a prison per se. Um, I mean, there was this one place they talked about called, like, something camp. And, of course, there was more like a boot camp where you got treated like shit. It wasn't a, you know, camp in that sense. They call it camp because it sounds nice. But they, uh... They did finish this prison, and I don't know if they had control of multiple prisons, and I would think they probably did, because if they're going to outsource, why would you just outsource one prison? Um, it would make more sense to outsource all of them, which is probably what they did. They didn't mention that all the old prisons were outsourced as well, but I assume that they were. So, now you have this guy, and then you have the president, the uh, Michael, whatever the fuck his name is, douchebag, that basically would uh, cover things up and... You know, Michael Cohen. And, of course, take money. So what they started doing, now that they had police in the schools and they had their zero zero tolerance policy, I mean, they were arresting kids for ridiculous fucking shit. It, it, It was whatever it might be, things that schools in the past would normally handle they and and I don't know if you know the judges have relationships with police first of all don't think that they don't don't think there's some separation between the police and the judge they're, they're all in cahoots with each other and I'm sorry I'm I'm eating because if I don't, I'm going to pass out. Um, they are. I mean, as I've said before, there's no separation of power in government. It's all government. It's like saying that there's separation of power in a small corporation. They're all that corporation. They all work for the same corporation. There's no checks and balances. There's no um, separation of power. No. 
the only separation of power, and I've mentioned this a few times, and this is really how it should be, to be honest, and how it was supposed to be, if you really look at the Constitution, is that if everybody was armed to the extent of the police at, at minimum, if not the military. And I'm not necessarily saying like nuclear weapons, but um, because that would just be pointless uh, if you got to that point where you're dro- dropping, there's a civil war and you're dropping nuclear weapons and you're destroying the country so no matter who wins i mean you both lose so if the people had the access to the weapons that the military did that would be a separation of power and like i said it would it, i've said that before it would usually end in standoffs, and that would be the whole point, is that, oh, you're violating our rights, you need to stop it, and they would stop it. Now, as I said before, of course, because they have the power to make laws, the government, they would somehow take that away, or they do something where they would get the advantage somehow, and it wouldn't work. And that really, I think, is the only thing or only way that government could possibly work is if people had essentially their own military that didn't come under the jurisdiction of the government, period. But I think what would happen is what I just said, that no matter what, because they're the ones making the laws, they'd either start banning certain things that the people had or they'd figure out a way to give them some kind of advantage where they could... um, get away with what they wanted to get away with and somehow eliminate that separation of powers. And how people have been convinced for hundreds of years now, I guess, that somehow having three branches of government is a separation of powers and a check and balance is crazy. And I don't give a fuck if you're talking about 1802 or now. Now, I think probably back then they may have followed it a little more to the letter maybe but you know meaning that if uh, even well that's not even true because the Supreme Court was never supposed to have the job of ruling on whether something is constitutional or not They just made that one up. They said, hey, and that's why, and this is about the judicial system as well, as well as what these fucks were doing. But they kind of just said, hey, we're going to do this. Um, I I think there was a specific case. Um, Was it Marbury versus Madison that essentially did that, among other things? Um, I think it was. 
but they never that was never the intention so they did it right away and even going back that far you didn't have checks and balances because you can't you can't have checks and balances when your checks and balances are all within the government and all under the government and of course the average person doesn't think about any of this shit I don't know what the average person does. The average person goes to work, worries about paying their bills, keeping their marriage going, um, or not getting caught with their mistress, taking care of their kids, getting their kids the things that they want, things they didn't have, uh, keeping up with their job. I mean... The average person doesn't have the time to really think about things like this. Plus, you know, you have so much, so many channels, as I was talking about earlier, and you get so much news thrown at you and you just catch headlines and this and that. You don't really get the details of anything. You just get the headlines. But, I mean, something like that, like separation of powers. When's the last time anyone's heard the media? Or when's the, when has the media ever... I'll say when's the last time. Has anyone ever heard the media question separation of powers or talk about it or have a discussion about separation of powers and um, how it's still all under government and checks and balances. You know, I know people like Glenn Beck or you know, Hannity or people that talk about the Constitution, the conservatives, it might come up to them. And I believe I heard Glenn Beck, you know, say, yeah, we have checks and balances. Like, it's only to confirm the fact that checks and balances exist, separation of power exists, But it doesn't. And I wish I could think of a better analogy to to explain it better. But it's like, I mean, if you take three people and you say, okay, you're in charge of the judicial system. You're in charge of the executive branch and you're Congress. I mean... And you're all friends and you hang out all the time and whatever. And you're all part of the same team. I mean, it's not the best analogy, but that's like what it is. So when it came to these judges... These police that were at the schools that they were calling school resource officers or whatever bullshit name they gave them, they, I'm sure, brought in cases for these guys. Well, it was really Mark Mark Civarella was the one who was actually doing it. The other guy covered it up, and got money out of it. Because he was the president of the judges. So I'm sure that the police 
because even in one of the stories, so I mentioned this uh, earlier that I started to go into it and then said, well, I'll talk about it in detail later. So there was a girl who her and her friends, and I don't know what happened to her friends. Maybe she's the only one who got in trouble, but that doesn't really make sense. But they don't mention her friends. They just maybe because her friends wouldn't go on camera. But she's the one who really actually brought this guy down. Um, her lawyers, her mom, really her mother, her fa- her grandfather, and her mother. Um, because her grandfather helped as well, and he's the one who really pushed her mother. So they're really the ones who brought this fuckhead down. So what he was doing, um, I didn't even go into that, was he would take these bullshit crimes, and as he had said to them when he visited them in school, he would put them in jail. For a few months. And what would happen is the prisons, because they were private prisons, and, you know, one, they they always have those contracts, you know, 90% capacity. But maybe he was uh, trying to get them uh, filled over that. And with juvenile prisons, I, I don't know how that makes money and it's probably that they get paid by the inmate or something because obviously if you have more inmates it's something like they gave a figure what it cost uh at least there for the juvenile inmates and it was something like 88,000 a year so they may get paid by the inmate while having to keep it at 90% capacity as well. Um, And I don't know exactly how that worked. But so maybe for each inmate, they'd get, you know, $100,000 or whatever. So... Whatever they were getting, it was probably more than that if it was over a certain thing. I wonder what the specifics were and how they could afford to pay him. But they they must have been getting a lot of money per prisoner if they were able to pay this guy the type of money. Because they, they talked about, you know, at the end of this thing, I mean, these guys had like... $2.6 million or something ridiculous. But, I mean, that's over time. Yeah. <clears throat> it says uh, they oh, between the two that they had $2.6 million in kickbacks. That's crazy. And that's that they f- what they found. Um, I don't know if they just found the records and that's how, because I'm thinking like, you know, obviously they spent some of the money, but maybe they just had found uh, the records from the prison. Sorry about that. (laughs) Um, So I don't know, again, how long that was over, what period of time. Maybe it was... um, Because they got caught, I believe, in 2000. There was some stuff in 2005, so it must have been after the election. And I think they went to court in 2000. Maybe it was a couple of years. uh, I know it was somewhere around there. So it was a couple of years after his second election. So say... They were doing it maybe seven years or something. I mean, that's still a lot of money over that amount of time. So for each inmate that he got sent there, they got a kickback. And I don't know how they split it or whatever. But so there was this girl who posted up, you know, back then was MySpace. And that wasn't even that long ago. Poor MySpace guy. 
Um, but anyway, so they essentially um, and, and th- this is how it, or why I was saying the police must have been involved as well. And maybe the police even got some money from the judges, you know, not the type of money that they were getting, but maybe it was, hey, you do this and, you know, I'll give you a couple hundred bucks. You know, I'll give you 500 bucks or, you know, a couple hundred or something like that. So this girl created a MySpace page. She put a disclaimer on it as well, which was smart, just in case... You know, she didn't want to get any in any trouble. And I believe in the disclaimer was that, you know, it wasn't really her. This is a parody, whatever. So they put they made a page making fun of their vice principal, I believe. And so they get a call at the house from a police officer and I guess the mother answers the phone asks the daughter about MySpace and you know she's like she asks if she has a MySpace page or whatever and you know she's like why and told her that there's a cop on the phone they're going to come and arrest her for her MySpace page Now, first of all, that, of course, violates freedom of speech right away. And she put a disclaimer on it as well. So if you want to, I mean, the only case you would have, (laughs) which it'd be very hard to prove, would be a civil suit. And it would be, you know, defamation or uh, libel. I forget which ones. Uh, I think libel's print and slander is, is spoken. But obviously, being that it was a parody, it was said it was a parody and the disclaimer, then there's. I don't even think that libel would apply anyway. So really... All they could do if they were actually following the law is they may have a case of expelling her from school because I've seen that before where, you know, kids have said stuff about their principal or teachers online and got expelled from school. Now, that doesn't make it legal and it definitely doesn't make it right but I know that has happened but as far as criminal charges there's no crime that has been broken in in that case because she has the freedom of speech to write whatever she wants. And again, the fact that she put a disclaimer that it was a parody, um, which she didn't even have to do, but that was smart to do, being that it was her vice principal and, you know, she didn't want to get in, uh, in trouble if they had found out. But there's no case there. So the cop says to the mother, because they said they were going to call a lawyer, and he says, I'm going to come over right now to arrest your daughter. Now, I I can't recall what the ridiculous charge they were going to charge her with was, because there is no charge uh, that would fit that. So I I can't even remember what what it was that they uh, they had charged her with because uh, I hadn't 
written down the individual examples. I wasn't going to really go through those in detail. Um, But anyway, they say that once they say they're not going to get a lawyer, then the cop says, okay, Um, he ultimately says that he doesn't have to come down there and he'll send a summons. So the judge didn't want any lawyers involved. Obviously, because what he was doing was fucking illegal on so many levels because, you know, one, he's getting the kickbacks, but he's charging people with things that aren't even crimes. How he even got away with that. See, this went on for years. And how the fuck could you get away with that shit? It shows, one, where the checks and balances. Um, But it shows how fucked up the system is and how many people... I mean, this is one guy that got caught or one... You know, if you want to call it a ring. I mean, it was two guys. But one incident of... Not not incident, but one um, whatever. One scam that was running but with these two guys. That took years for them to even uh, be charged with anything. So you can imagine how many people, one, may have even been inspired by this and say, hey, we're judges. Let's think of uh, some way we can scam the system. First of all, you know what judges are? Are failed lawyers because judges don't make a lot of money. I mean... Depending on where you're a judge and what level you're on. So, like, depending on, you know, are you a circuit court judge? Are you a federal prosecutor? Um, not, sorry, not federal prosecutor. That's not a judge. Um, the federal... Um, appellate court judges, the ones right before the Supreme Court, I forget what they're called, they're federal something, um, or state Supreme Court or whatever. Depending on what level you're at and what type of job, I mean, obviously, the higher you are, the more money you make. But if you're a really good defense attorney you can make more money than probably what the Supreme Court has paid, which I believe is public information, so I can look that up. But, I mean, you look at the best defense attorneys in the country, I mean, they're probably making, you know, 20, 30 times what the Supreme Court makes. And I, this is just a total uh, speculation, but they're making, in, you know, good defense attorneys or great defense attorneys are making millions of dollars. You know, I keep thinking of like Johnny Cochran, who's dead now, but, you know, those type of guys. And even pretty good ones, you know, might be making 200, 300 grand a year. And then, of course, you have a lot of struggling lawyers that aren't making shit. So for every lawyer that's really successful, you probably got, you know, three or four that are not. But that's where it's, hey, you know, why don't I run for uh, the local judge? Like the fucking judge that I had to deal with, the piece of shit. Um, who I think, ah, shit, did I miss his re-election? I think he's up for re-election this year, 
and I can picture his fucking goofy ass face, but I can't uh, think of his name right now. Anyway, um, you know, he's a piece of fucking shit. But for a job like that, he's a judge in the city court. The only criminal he deals with is minor misdemeanors and then deals with, I think, family stuff. And I, I don't know. He deals with a whole bunch of shit, but it's like all minor... You know, it's like a low judge position. So you're going to tell me that if you weren't, if you were a good lawyer, that could make, and I could figure, I can find out what he makes uh, because it's all it, transparency. Nevada shows the salaries. I think I did. I think it was like sixty grand. Um, I think he made because. I remember him, I believe, making less than me. And, you know, even my lawyer, who didn't do a very good job, um, obviously, because I would have got off. And this is for the, the obstruction of an officer where I got ripped out of my car uh, for no reason and thrown on the ground. I got bruises all over me. Well, ripped out of my car just because I questioned why I was being asked to get out of my car. So, obviously, this guy can't make it as a lawyer. So, he ran as a judge and won. So, that's really what fucking judges are anyway. So, anyway, um, the girl... They, once she said she didn't, her mother said that they wouldn't hire a lawyer. They were going to get something in the mail. And I guess it took a long time. They finally got something in the mail. And then she went to court. And they thought it was going to be like community, like she was going to plead guilty to some bullshit charge and she was going to get community service and you know probation or something like that she ends up going to jail going to I don't know if she went to the camp or the actual jail and I believe it was for like three or four months I mean, all these people that they showed, and I'm sure in the documentary, they they went through a bunch of the cases of people that were willing to talk about it. And some of them went, went for years um, because they'd show the initial date. And then they'd show the get out date. And I'm like, what the fuck? There was one kid who, and his this really fucked up his life because later he got into drugs and whatever. But he had a bike that they claim was stolen. His parents gave it to him. And they had... Um, bought it from a relative and they arrested his parents as well. They never actually said what happened with his parents. But if the parents admit that they gave the bike to him, I don't see why they wouldn't let him go there. But of course he went to jail and he went for a while. Um, there was another kid so, this is really fucked up, too. And uh, before I move forward, getting back to the cop, that cop, once they said that they weren't going to hire a lawyer, it changed his tune where he was saying he was going to come and pick her up and arrest her right there. Obviously, he knew to do that. So 
he obviously had something going on with the judge at that point where you know he was he was doing what the judge says cuz think about it the judge they uh say they're not going to hire a lawyer and then he says oh well I don't have to pick you up now did he come up with that on his own like why would you uh just say that so obviously and of course they never went after any of the cops but obviously he was in on something now whether he knew that the judge was getting money or what or the judge had just told him hey it's easier you know whatever it is to uh, prosecute these cases and we need to keep the jails full and you know here I'll give you a hundred bucks if you know whatever I, I don't know but obviously the cops are corrupt in this situation as well so the last specific case I'm going to talk about because we're running out of time, I, I definitely got to go at 10, um, is there was a kid who got into trouble a few times. But the initial time, he had never gotten in trouble. And I think because of this, he was very resentful, and then I believe he did actually get in trouble. But he was a wrestler. And it, it, this is really sad, and at the same time, the parents really pissed me off. And and they did something, and, and you'll see why when I get to this part of what happened, but... Or the mother, because um, I think she kind of blames herself. So the father couldn't find the kid. He was friends with some cops. So, and I believe he told the mother he was doing this. And they, I guess he skipped school or something and went to, uh, and he might have not have skipped school. He might have just been there. But I think he did. I think he skipped school and went to uh, a drinking party, they called it. So, skipped school, went to a party and to drink. Which, whatever. He was in high school. You know, I don't think it's a big deal. If you did that every day, yeah, but... So whatever, so he did that. So what the father did, the fuckhead that he was, he asked the cops to plant like a pipe on him, like some drug uh, paraphernalia, because it must have been illegal there, at, at least at the time. Um, I don't know if I know Tommy Chong went to jail for uh, really to save his son from going to jail, but um, for bongs, selling bongs, this is ridiculous. But anyway, I don't know if they're still illegal now because of all the legalized marijuana. But at the time, I guess they were. So they had the cops plant a pipe on him because the parents thought that, oh, well, you know, if he gets arrested, it will be a little slap on the wrist and, you know, it might uh, straighten him out. And that sounds like something my father would, would say, to be honest. And this is a mentality of fucking fucked up parents. This is just, to me fucked up on so many levels and I talk about how important it is to bring your kids up uh, following peaceful parenting and non-discipline and all of these things because 
otherwise you grow up, your kids grow up essentially ready for the state to take over as their new parent, which the state is partially their parent during that whole time anyway. So they did that. The fucking cops, first of all, planted a pipe on them. So they were corrupt. And he ends up in the that judge's fucking uh, court and ends up going to jail. And then I think after that, it, his mother was saying that he totally changed and he might have went to jail again. I don't know if it was that he went to jail for a long time on that case. And that might be actually what happened. I'm trying to remember the when they had the pictures out and the the dates there, but he might've been one of the ones who was sentenced for like years because these, these sentences that they have in the courts, like the sentence get guidelines, they allow judges to give ridiculous uh, amounts of time. It's just, it, it's it, the whole fucking system is just so fucked up. It's frustrating to me. I, and I wish I had more time to talk more about it. I mean, I've talked about it in the past, but I have just so much more to even say about it. But so he ends up killing himself, um, which, of course, is really sad and the people so his mother i was going to say the people who should blame themselves is his fucking parents along with the judge of course and the police but the mother goes to the court when the judge is being sentenced and he was sentenced twice the first time I think he basically got off with a lighter sentence and then uh, they might have charged them with uh, another crime because I think initially they charged them with one thing and then they came back and maybe charged them with uh, some more crimes because they had like a whole list of crimes like, you know, even... um, income tax fraud and all of this stuff along with, you know, whatever crimes they got from him taking bribes. But the um, mother flips out, starts yelling at the judge and how he said about being accountable and all this shit. And now he, you know, he has to be accountable and you know, I'm, I was thinking, I, I didn't realize at the time that that was the same mother. But then after, I was thinking that she blames herself. And that's partially why she went after him, I think. But she should. Because look what they they did. I mean, why would you do that to your kid anyway, number one? Because you think that it will straighten them out. And they said how he was a wrestler, he was wrestling since he was a kid, and it's his life. I mean, he was like fucking 17 already. I think he was even in jail. He was in a juvenile jail, and he was over 18, or uh, I think maybe they can keep you till you're 21, maybe that's why. But it's it's crazy. So uh, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, what happened was the the judge who was doing all the sentencing, Mark Silverella, ended up getting 28 and a half years in jail in federal prison. And he actually went to trial and was found guilty. And then the other guy... Uh, that tried to cover it up, the Michael Conahan, who was getting money from it too and was the president judge, uh, got 
sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison and had to pay 840 874,000 in restitution um also during that time I had mentioned uh, Eric Holder and the 750 million in 2012 Obama gave another 125 to hire even more police and now I mean all these schools are filled with whatever the fuck they call them but they they have essentially police stations and courts in bare, almost I mean they don't have a court but in this school they had probation at the school it, it's it's crazy you know and they talk about the school to prison pipeline I mean essentially you're in prison when you're in school during the day um on one of the clips that had talked about a fourth grader being arrested for making a bow and arrow motion with his hands. There was a kid uh, arrested because they found a leaf in a bag, but it wasn't any drug. Um, There was a story in Minnesota Uh, that I had posted earlier today um, that I wanted to mention real briefly, and that's probably all the time we're going to have left, unfortunately. But in Minnesota, they have cameras... Uh, first, you have like a card to enter. They have cameras, 40 security guards. This is in St. Paul, I guess Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities. Um, 40 security guards, 10 police um, patrolling the halls. And I, I don't know why people don't just pull their kids right out of school. I, I, I don't get it. And I know people have two jobs, not two jobs, but both parents work. But as I had mentioned before, I'm sure there's plenty of like-minded people that would like to pull their kids out of school as well. And you come up with a plan, get a group together And, you know, maybe some of you work different hours or you can hook up with somebody who is a stay at home um, wife and everybody else can chip in to pay her. Um, You know, you figure it out and it's it's getting out of hand. Kids are just getting brainwashed they're ending up in jail. A lot of them actually are not necessarily jail, like to this extreme with this guy, but they are getting arrested for ridiculous things that happen in school. So they get fingerprinted, they get that on file and they get a record, although, you know, juvenile record isn't a big deal, but don't think that ju- judges don't have access to it because they do, because I thought it was totally sealed. And then they pulled it out uh, later um, after I wasn't a juvenile anymore. We'll just put it that way. And that's that was crazy. And I don't even consider it. It's not my record. It's the record that the fucking government uh, holds on me. Um, but it's ridiculous. The, the, the whole system is ridiculous and there are no checks and balances. There is no freedom there. And, and I don't mean to be negative and, and sit here and make people sad or, or, or whatever, I mean, there's things you can do to make things better, but 
I, I don't know how long that's going to last. I, I really don't. You see all the technology and all of this stuff, and you realize that the government can get away with whatever they want. They can kill you and, you know, get away with it like it's nothing. And there's no checks and balances when it comes to the people. The people, that bullshit that people say, well, we are the government. No, we're not. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. Um, one of the things, though, that people can do, and they don't even have to violate the law to do it, is take your kids out of school. I wish that it, we could start a national campaign. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not well known enough, not even close, but to homeschool and to pull all your everybody, pull all your kids out of school, you know, and have group homeschools. Like I said, everybody in a neighborhood get together or it doesn't have to be a neighborhood because you probably want more like minded people. You want to teach your kids the similar things. Um, but that's something that you can do. You can say fuck you to the government and you don't have to get their permission and they can't stop you. So, you know, it's within your legal right. Now, I'm sure if everybody did that, they try to make it illegal pretty quick. But that's where you go get into non-compliance. It's non-compliance to me is the key. Non-compliance and self-defense. Um, it really is. But that's all we have for tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. Sorry I was uh, late, but I guess I made up for it by staying an <laughs> extra hour. So, um, But I really do appreciate everybody that listens in. Um, you know, every listen is important to me. I mean, the fact that I get any listens at all is, uh, you know, great that I can say that I'm reaching people, whether I'm really reaching <laughs> people or not, or if it's just going in and out of their head or they're just listening for a couple minutes and turning it off. I don't know, but... Hopefully, I'm reaching people out there, and and I, I appreciate you uh, tuning in. I really do. So thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good night. And I will – I don't want to say I'll see you tomorrow because that's what I was saying. I will uh, – I'll be on tomorrow, so you'll hear me tomorrow. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>